Okay, why don't we settle in? Well, good afternoon, thanks for coming. I'm Tad Schmaltz, uh, Chair of the Philosophy Department, and I'd like to welcome you to the 44th Annual Tanner Lecture on Human Values at the University of Michigan. I'll introduce our speaker in a moment, but first I'd like to say a few words about the Tanner Lecture Series and the Tanner Family. The Tanner Lecture on Human Values, which is administered by the Philosophy Department, was permanently endowed by Grace Adams Tanner and Obert Clark Tanner in 1978. However, a lecture at Michigan the previous year by the political and legal philosopher Joel Feinberg inaugurated the series. In addition to Michigan, five other institutions were originally designated as permanent sponsors of the lectureship, and these include Clare Hall at the University of Cambridge, Grays Nose College at uh, Oxford, University of Oxford, Harvard University, Stanford University, and the University of Utah. Yale University and the University of California, Berkeley, were added as sponsors in 1987, and Princeton University was added in 1988. Over the years, Tanner Lectures have been delivered at other uh, universities worldwide as well. Uh, the lectures themselves are published in an annual volume. The Tanners had broad intellectual interests. Grace Tanner's interests inclined toward the sciences, especially biology and anthropology. Obert Tanner studied at the University of Utah in philosophy and law. After receiving his law degree, he studied and taught philosophy and religious studies at Harvard University and Stanford University, and was a professor of philosophy at the University of Utah for 27 years. He also was a successful businessman, having founded in 1927 the O.C. Tanner Company, which produces a range of jewelry uh, that businesses use to reward individual accomplishments. And an interesting side note is that the company also struck the medals for the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. The Tanners were generous philanthropists who supported the Utah Symphony Orchestra, Ballet West, and the Utah Opera Company. They also built more than 40 public fountains and established philosophy libraries at 11 major colleges and universities, including our own splendid Tanner Philosophy Library here at Michigan on the first floor of Angel Hall. Over the years, many distinguished intellectual figures have delivered the Tanner Lectures at Michigan, including Sir Karl Popper, Tor Tony Morrison, Henry Louis Gates Jr., and John Rawls. At Michigan, it is our practice to take the Tanner Lecture as the occasion for a thorough consideration of its ideas. Each year, we have a program the morning following the lecture in which scholars from various disciplines offer perspectives on the lecture, and join in a panel discussion. This year, the symposium will be held tomorrow morning from 10 to 12.30, 10 in the morning to 12.30, in the Rackham Amphitheater located on the fourth floor upstairs in this building. Our symposiasts this year are Kyla Ebels duggan uh, Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Brady Program in Ethics and Civ Civic Life, at Northwestern University, Ann Phillips, Emeritus Professor and formerly Graham Wallace Professor of Political Science at the London School of Economics, and Don Herzog, Edson R. Sunderland Professor of Law at the University of Michigan. Uh, due to illness, Professor Herzog won't be able to be with us in person. His role will be played tomorrow by uh, Liz Anderson, our Max Mendel Shea Professor of Public Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. At this point, I'm pleased to introduce our Tanner lecturer for this year, Elen Landemore, Professor of Political Science at Yale University. Professor Landemore is well known for her work on democracy, which includes her books, Democratic Reason, Politics, Collective Intelligence, and the Role of the Many, which was published in 2013, 
and awarded the American Political Association Best Book Award and the David and Elaine Spitz Prize. Open Democracy, Reinventing Public Rule for the 20, 20th Century, which was published in 2020. And uh, with Jason Brennan, Debating Democracy, Do We Need More or Less, which was published in 2021. In addition to producing this scholarly work, Professor Landemore has been involved in several public-facing projects. As faculty fellow with Yale's Institute for Social and Political and Policy sorry, Studies, she leads a new program, Citizens Assemblies Within Democratic Innovations, which is designed to identify and test ideas for improving the quality of democratic representation and governance. She is part of a group of female researchers who started the movement Democratizing Work in May 2020, and from 2022 to 23, she served on the governance board of the French Citizens Convention on the End of Life, which will feature, I think, in the lecture today. Another interesting feature of Professor Landemore's recent research is her concern to address ethical issues relating to artificial intelligence, or AI. Since 2022, she has been a distinguished researcher at the Institute for Ethics in AI at the University of Oxford. Professor Landemore is currently working with the director of this institute, John Taziolas, I hope that's correct, um, on a book on the ethics and politics of AI. This work is funded by a shared award from the Schmidt Futures AI 2050 program. The connection of Professor Landemore's work in this area to the issue of democracy, which is central to today's lecture, is indicated by the fact that she is a member of the Application Advisory Committee for OpenAI's grant program, Democratic Inputs to, to AI. Professor Landemore's lecture today, Truth and Love in Politics, concerns the ways in which the pursuit of truth in democratic politics requires strong civic bonds deriving from a form of love. Or at least that's my thumbnail sketch. Let's see how accurate it is. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Landemore as this year's Tanner Lecturer. Hi everyone, this is intimidating. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's an incredible honor to be giving this year's Tanner Lecture on Human Values at the University of Michigan. When I'm used to a philosopher friend with whom I was sharing the good news of this invitation, why on earth you chose me, he said, and I quote, they must need hope. I think that's a very valid reason to want, to, give me, um, to want me to give a lecture, and so I will try to deliver by talking about how we can inject more truth and love, two of the best human values, into our politics at a time when it clearly lacks both. I had the idea for this talk while watching an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet at the Almeida Theatre in London in June 2023. In her stunning adaptation, the director, Rebe Rebecca Frecknell, a genius in my view, chose to cast actors from all races to represent members of the two warring families, the Capulets and the Montagues, so that it doesn't matter that her Juliet is white and her Romeo is black. The big divide between the families is not race or blood, it's something else, ideology perhaps, and bitter commitment to old grievances. The modernity of this interpretation is that it maps onto many political divides of today's world, which pit people against each other in increasingly polarizing ways. The Montagues and the Capulets, Romeo and Juliet's Italian families who hate each other with a passion, could just as well be Republicans and Democrats today in contemporary America. In the US, it's now well documented that partisan ideology has risen above most other differences, including race, as a reason not to marry someone or to disapprove of a relative marrying someone else. 
The Capulets and Montagues might even stand for Israelis and Palestinians in the Middle East today, where it's hard to imagine a bigger and more long-lasting hatred between two communities, even as they have so much in common. What could possibly cure such miserable states of affairs in the world? And bring warring sides towards reconciliation and closer to what I would argue is a form of moral truth. Because in Shakespeare, there's only one right outcome, the one that does not end with the death of two children. Shakespeare's message appeared to me, appeared to me that day clear in that play. Love is the answer. Love alone can fix the world and bring us closer to the light, even if it tragically does not in that particular play. But it does not for a reason, because the play is meant to serve as a warning. The point is that love could have fixed things. Perhaps the ending of the story could never have been perfectly happy. Maybe Romeo and Juliet would have had to move to a completely different city, but it needed not be so tragic. Things could have turned out very differently. One piece of evidence for this claim is the fact that in a crucial turn of the play, Romeo's attraction for Juliet initially opens him to the possibility of reconciliation and peace. It's his feelings for Juliet that make him refuse to answer the provocations of Tybalt, the young hothead of the other family. When Tybalt starts to poke him, Romeo first ignores the repeated provocations and tries to deflect. One of the ways he deflects is by saying, I love you. Not once, but twice. So in Act 3, scene 1, Tybalt says, Romeo, the hate I bear thee can afford no better turn than this. Thou art a, vil a villain. End quote. Romeo replies, Tybalt, the reason that I have to love thee does much excuse the appurtening rage to such a greeting. Villain am I none, therefore farewell. I see thou knows me, knows me not. Unfortunately, that first declaration does not work. Tybalt comes back charging. So Romeo tries again, even more effusively. I do protest, I never injured thee, but love thee better than thou canst devise. Still thou shalt know the reason of my love, and so good Capulet, which name I tender as dearly as my own, be satisfied. Unfortunately, again, none of this works, and in the battle that ensues anyway, Tybalt ends up killing Romeo's friend, Marcusio. And next thing you know, Romeo curses Juliet's beauty for making him weak. O oh, sweet Juliet, thy beauty hath made me effeminate, and in my temper softened valor steel. And he runs off to avenge his friend. In other words, Romeo, overcome by rage and grief, regrets his loving overture to Tybalt, and in a bout of what one might call now toxic masculinity, he blames Juliet for his earlier peaceful overtures, now seen as cowardice. He goes on to kill Tybalt, which makes the prospect of his already unlikely union with his true love, let alone a reconciliation between the houses, all but impossible. Love didn't stop the bloodshed, but it could have. It's the only thing that could have, really. One of the darker conclusions of the play, however, is that when too much blood has been spilled, things cannot be turned around. It's too late, at least for that generation of enemies. I'll come back later to the conclusions one can derive from Shakespeare's play for politics more generally. But for now, let me just say what it convinced me to try in this talk. Shakespeare's powerful message convinced me that what has been crucially missing and is still missing, in large part, from our conversations in political philosophy, and more specifically, democratic theory, deliberative democracy, and political epistemology, the subfields I know best, and what we need to learn to talk about is love, not erotic love, per se, as the love between Romeo and Juliet, but rather a form of civic love for one's fellow citizens, of the kind that Romeo tried to extend to Tybalt across the aisle, so to speak, because of his erotic love for Juliet. That sounds like a corny argument to make, I'm sure. It turns out it's not easy to talk about love in a philosophical or social scientific matter, manner. And believe me, I, I hesitated pursuing that topic for this lecture. That's probably why the best work on love has been produced by artists, poets, singers. Even Plato spoke about it in allegorical rather than analytical terms, while Aristotle, the quintessential logician or social scientist, did not have that much to say about it. It also sounds potentially dangerous. Isn't politics more practically about power and interests, as some of my colleagues in political science would say? Worse, isn't the attempt to make it about truth and love a classic utilitarian move forcing a unity 
of thought and artificial consensus, stifling any form of dissent, disagreement, of, or diversity of thought that threats to those ideals, and ultimately resulting in things like mass famines and genocides. Hell is paved with pronouncements of truth and declarations of love. There is a respectable um, philosophical tradition that sees things this way, which has notably led to sidelining the role of emotions in deliberative democracy. But I would argue that this tradition assumes a certain conception of both truth and love in politics and how they might interact with one another that can be challenged. There is something that can be powerful with experiences of love in politics, an experience that can contribute to fostering a sense of community and enable collective agency. Additionally, Shakespeare's own unapologetic corniness made me embrace an intuition I had started developing a few years prior in my empirical research on um, French assemblies, namely that love might well be a crucial political emotion. Fittingly, this intuition came in the form of a revelation not unlike love itself, while I was focused on other things. In fall 2019, I got a chance to go and study in person the deliberation of 150 randomly selected French citizens. It was at the Citizens' Convention on Climate, the first Citizens' Assembly ever organized in France at the national le level. So Citizens' Assemblies, for those of you who may not be familiar with the concept, are large, randomly selected bodies of citizens gathered to deliberate about a policy issue um, sometimes for a couple of days, sometimes for a couple of months. Think of them as very large juries that aim to capture the full diversity of a population and at best can mirror, um, you know, the, the, the mirror perfectly their demographic traits. Um, in the French case, the First Citizens' Assembly was born as a response to the so-called Yellow Vest Crisis, a social movement that erupted in November 2018 in response to a fuel task passed by the Macron government. The protesters gathered in traffic circles, donning the reflective yellow vest that French drivers are required by law to keep in their vehicles in case of a roadside emergency. Hence the name given to the movement, the yellow vest movement. As the protest and violence escalated, President Macron launched a deliberative response, a two month long nationwide great national debate, which I'm not gonna talk about, and, more importantly, a citizens' convention inspired by the results of this national debate and the Irish precedents. Ireland, a few years, ago, a few years prior, had experimented with citizens' assembly on, on marriage equality and abortion, among other topics. This convention in France was tasked with formulating law proposals to curb French greenhouse gas emissions in a way compatible with social justice. In other words, Macron, President Macron, threw the gauntlet at a representative sample of the French people. You hate my carbon tax? Well, you go and figure out a better solution. Needless to say, for a deliberative Democrat like myself, setting foot in this assembly, which took place in the beautiful, beautiful brutalist building of the Jena Palace, the seat of our third legislative chamber, the CESU, just next to the Eiffel Tower, was a dream come true. After theorizing and reading about it or reconstructing deliberative processes after the fact through interviews as I had done in the Icelandic, uh, in the case of the Icelandic constitutional process uh, in, of 2010, I was about to see collective intelligence emerge under my very eyes in my native tongue among my fellow citizens. As I spent time observing this convention, however, it was not the collective intelligence that struck me, though I did get to see it emerge over um, eight months. It's much more strikingly the deep emotional bond between participants. I call it love because that's how it was manifested, voiced, and expressed by the participants, even as it came in a variety of shades from crimson red to light pink. I call it love because that's what it was. And by love, I mean the umbrella concept of an intense feeling of deep affection for someone or something under which other feelings like empathy, sympathy, solidarity, or even friendship may fall. I understand all these other emotions as derivative forms of love, even as they do not quite capture the full intensity of the emotions I observed in these deliberative settings of citizens' assemblies. This realization that love was central to what I was observing down on me at around the time when in the United States, a daring, and to put it mildly, um, eccentric democratic candidate to the presidential elections Marianne Williamson was talking about a politics of love 
there's even a book by this title, as the only viable alternative to the politics of fear and hatred offered, according to her, by Donald Trump. Even though I had initially dismissed her as unrealistic and too naive, after the convention I started thinking she might be onto something. It was unsettling intellectually. In my work until then, I had always ignored the role of emotions. It's not that I thought they did not matter, but I proceeded as if they were a separate object of study that could be bracketed for analytical purposes. For years, I wrote and focused on the so-called epistemic dimension of democratic politics, namely the way democratic procedures can generate a form of collective intelligence, perhaps even truth or wisdom, by tapping the many brains of their people. I was interested in the purely epistemic or cognitive side of politics, information, arguments, reasoning, and how, individuals, um, and how individual thought processes, including partly biased and irrational ones, could turn into what I call democratic reason, the collective intelligence of a democratic people. To the extent that emotions or passions entered the picture in my work thus far, it was as a thing that needed to be translated into reasons or simply resisted and overcome. Yet, without emotions and love more centrally, I now conclude it's unlikely that deliberation can yield any form of truth or wisdom. So in this lecture, I'm going to talk about love in its relation to truth. Specifically, I want to make the case, at least hypothesize, that love is what activates powers and sustains the epistemic properties of deliberation in the citizens' assemblies I observed. In turn, I will also argue that it is an orientation toward truth tracking or truth building that is most conducive to the emergence of love between participants. There is thus a two-way relationship between truth and love in politics that I want to explore with you today. Let me first turn to the place of truth in politics. This is uh, closer to what my work has been um, on so far. In 1967, Anna Arendt wrote the famous essay, Truth and Politics, which my own title for this lecture pays homage to. In this essay, she claims that while politics should be concerned about the truth of facts, particularly historical facts, it should not get involved in debates about rational truth, particularly not those of the moral type, because truth claims in that realm are coercive by nature and leave no room for debate. Arendt seemingly rejects truth claims in politics, not because of a relativist conviction that there are no such things um, uh, as right and wrong, or true and false answers in politics, but because the endorsement of such a view would undermine the very essence of politics. If politics is about debate and disagreement, truth claims can only put an end to it. My own work has largely consisted of arguing the opposite. By defending political cognitivism, which I define as the view that at least some political questions lend themselves to better or worse answers, and that there is a procedure independent standard of correctness for political judgment, or at least that we need to posit it. My claim was in part that politics cannot just be about the adjudication of conflicting preferences, interests, and fundamental differences in values, which is a view largely dominant in political science departments. And in that view, there is no procedural standard, in the standard of correctness to assume, and the right outcome can only be the one produced by the procedure, centrally voting. In other words, politics is also, or so are argued, about tracking a form of truth, whether it is objective, factual truth, a more socially and politically constructed kind of truth, which we also partly built, or even a universal moral form of truth for those who believe in, say, um, a certain versions of, version of human rights. Positing such a procedural and independent standout um, of correctness, whether we call it the truth or something else, seemed to me necessary to make sense and use of some of our democratic procedures, centrally deliberation, part deliberation more so than voting, actually. Surely, we do not deliberate just for the sake of deliberating. We deliberate in the hope of figuring out something, and it is this something that I propose to call truth with a small t. I still think this is the right view, on condition that we take a thin and plural view of what truth means. For Anna Arendt, as well as the later generals, who shares with her an aversion to truth claims, sometimes characterized as epistemic abstinence, truth is obviously a thicker concept. Truth implies in their views the uniqueness and exclusivity of the true answer as well as an empirically documented tendency to entail exclusionary and sectarian behaviors. 
It is this thicker, historically tainted concept of truth that Arendt and Rawls rightly find unsuitable to a world characterized by a plurality of reasonable worldviews. But our concept of truth need not be so demanding or hostile. We can define it in ways that are minimal, non-metaphysical, and political even in the Rawlsian sense, following, for example, Joshua Cohen in his essay, Truth and Public Reason. We can think of truth as plural in nature, as Michael Lynch has proposed. We can even think of it in the pragmatist Williams James way as what works, including for a given context in a given community. But the fact is that we need truth as the normative horizon of our moral and political disagreements. Jürgen Zabermas line of argument here always seemed to me the most convincing. It consists of the famous transcendent pragmatic move he makes in communicative action, going back to the conditions of possibility of a certain type of human speech. There, Habermas argues that the existence of a procedure independent standard of correctness and the possibility of knowing it is inscribed in and presupposed by the very nature of our discursive exchanges and specifically our way of engaging our ways of engaging with each other's reason in moral arguments. If that was not the case, there would be no meaningful communication to speak of, as we would have to assume that people lie at all times or that they try to manipulate us or that physical coercion is a legitimate way to end a debate. I think what Habermas said of morality applies to politics as well, at least to a degree. There would be no point in deliberating about at least some political questions if there were no procedure independent standard of correctness to figure out. Whether you call it the right or the truth is not the problem. Truth is the background assumption that is simply needed to make sense of the fact that we are trying to figure out something together, not lie, coerce, or manipulate into each other each other into believing nonsense. So whatever the terms we use to refer to it, we therefore cannot do without it if we are to account for a crucial part of politics. The beauty of reintroduci reintroducing truth claims in politics is that it also gives a framework for thinking of democratic politics in epistemic terms. That is in terms that involve knowledge, information, and truth claims. Within this epistemic framework, with truth as the normative orientation of citizens and the horizon of their judgment, I was able to defend epistemic arguments for various democratic procedures, such as majority rule and deliberation, as having their own distinctive epistemic properties for tracking the truth. Briefly, majority rule benefits from the law of large numbers. As long as we assume a sincere disposition to figure out the truth among the voters, as well as their judgment, independence, and minimal likelihood of getting the answer right individually in the first place, so assuming that each voter is uh, better than a coin flip, the majority is virtually certain to be right as the number of voters goes to infinity. That's the Condorcet jury theorem in a nutshell. Deliberation, by contrast, is a richer, more dynamic tool for truth tracking, but also truth building. It constructs the truth building a consensus from people's shared values as much as it tracks it through information aggregation. Deliberation is conducive to truth when guided by the forceless force of the better argument, as Habermas puts it. It is also more likely to be conducive to truth when it benefits from the cognitive diversity of the par participants, that is, the difference in the ways they think about the world relative to the problem at hand. Unlike majority rule, deliberation does not require competence at the get-go since participants can educate and guide each other toward the right answer. Deliberators, I argued, are like climbers on a rugged epistemic landscape where the global optimum is not visible to anyone but can be figured out by exchanging information and knowledge. What deliberation does require, however, is a sincere orientation to, toward the truth and careful, respectful listening of other participants' views. Some critics reproach me for putting too much emphasis on truth and not enough on power. Upon reflection, though, I do not think that is where the mistake lay. The mistake was not to be clear in making room for truth in politics, but instead in not recognizing the crucial role of emotions in facilitating the emergence of truth. What I left completely unaddressed are the soul processes, the passions, the care, to use the language of um, theories of, of, uh, of care, and the emotional work that takes place and is actually necessary for the cognitive work to have any chance of succeeding. So, upon reflection, um, 
I should have asked the motivational question. What makes group of deliberators willing to talk and listen to each other? Trust each other enough to take seriously counter arguments to their view. Stick together through the exploration of the rugged landscape. Years of being taught in the liberal canon had convinced me that some form of rational self-interest was all it took. Self-interest, after all, seemed a minimally demanding requirement, one compatible with diverse, multicultural societies characterized by deep disagreement. Self-interest, well understood, um, is thus the background assumption of social, in social contract theory from Hobbes' Leviathan, in which a rational calculation leads individuals to leave the state of nature for a state of subordination to a sovereign that then solves the collective action problem um, and takes on the responsibility of defining what's right and wrong, to John Rawls' a theory of justice, which, differently but also similarly, assumes rational actors assess what is in their best long-term interest to want as the basic principles of a just society, given a veil of ignorance and the possibility that they may end up at the bottom of the social ladder. As their critics have often pointed out, such authors bracket the ties of community and the bonds of solidarity that could also motivate adhesion to a social contract. I'm no longer convinced that rational self-interest self alone can form the glue that keeps our polities together. I also no longer believe that reason, as, more, um, as, a, as practical reason or more elevated um, impartial and dispassionate form of reason can do that. I now believe instead that what Sharon Krause calls civil passions and Martha Nussbaum calls political emotions must be doing some of the work, perhaps most of the work. Like them, I'm now interested in how certain soul processes and passions condition the more cerebral aspect of politics. Like them, I think these political emotions have a cognitive dimension which blur the traditional line between passion and reason, perhaps bring the distinction closer to the difference between um, uh, fast and slow thinking in, in, in the Kahneman and Verskian terms. And like them, I too now seek to anchor political judgment in this hybrid ground. I would now like to explore two more specific claims. One is the claim that in order to have truth in politics, you also need love. As an epistemic democrat, this is a lesson I could have hid it from, say, Plato, whose central message, after all, is that no one can get to the higher form of truth, the knowledge of the forms, without what he calls the ladder of love, which is supposed to guide us from the love of a particular body to that of all beautiful bodies, to love of spiritual beauty, to love of beauty itself, and eventually love of knowledge and wisdom. Unfortunately, as an epistemic democrat, because Plato attaches his theory to a demanding notion of truth with a capital T and an illiberal and democratic understanding of politics, it's a lesson that I, it was easy for me to ignore. The second claim that I want to explore is that a collective search for truth may be conducive to love among the participants. This is an idea I could also have found in another figure of the political philosophy canon. In a passage from Darkwater, Voices from Within the Veil, titled On the Ruling of Men, W.E.B. Du Bois argues that, I quote, the real argument for democracy is that in the people, we have the source of that endless life and unbounded wisdom which the rulers of men must have, end of quote. This is, on the face of it, a classic epistemic argument for democracy on a par with Aristotle's more famous argument from the wisdom of the multitude in, in, in Politics 3.11, 3 uh, and a more beautiful one at that. But Du Bois' understanding of unbounded wisdom turns out to be much broader than what Aristotle had in mind, and what I had in mind so far. It's not simply common sense, information, factual knowledge, lived experience, prudential knowledge, and even moral knowledge, what epistemic democrats generally mean by wisdom. It includes love, among other things, which initially threw me off. And by the way, I want to uh, give a shout out to uh, uh, my colleague Jason Stanley and Liam Coffeebright, because they're the ones who brought to my attention this passage in, uh, in, in Darkwater, and I, I, it's one of, one of those rare moments in a, you know, in a philosopher's life where you find something that, that is truly, truly striking, and that was one of those moments. Um, consider this other passage from On the Ruling of Men, where Du Bois further explains, the vast and wonderful knowledge of this universe is locked in the bosoms of its individual souls. To tap this mighty reservoir of experience, knowledge, beauty, love, and deed 
we must appeal not to the few, not to some souls, but to all. This is an, another striking version of the epistemic claim for democracy. But also important is the fact that the wisdom of democracy here is meant to include non-cognitive things, such as beauty, love, and presumably good deeds. Du Bois had, has an all-encompassing notion of the kind of democratic truth we should strive for, and it includes erotic in the sense of love-related as well as aesthetic aspects. As in Plato, there's a sense in which true wisdom is multidimensional, encompasses more than mere knowledge, or ra rather redefines the very nature of knowledge as having emotional, aesthetical, and practical dimensions. And there's a sense in which if you unlock wisdom, you also unlock love. Alas, when I first encountered that passage, I confess that I did not quite understand it. I thought the extra bits about love, as well as beauty and good deeds, did not quite make sense and felt like a confusion of categories. I thought the beauty of the rhetoric got in the way of analytical clarity. Until, that is, that I had the experience myself of what those terms could mean in a very specific context. I will now share with you the experience that convinced me that Plato and Du Bois were essentially right, respectively, that love is a ladder to truth, and that unlocking truth or wisdom also means unlocking love. So before I proceed um, with the more empirical side um, of this um, presentation, let me say a word on the method of the next two sections, which consists of a rich description of citizens' assemblies and the interactions taking place in them. I call my approach here inductive political theory, by which I mean a political theory that starts from a field of study similar to that of, say, comparative politics, and uses some of its method, methods, such as observations and interviews, among others. But in order to find inspiration for new normative theories or claims, rather than to establish facts or causal relationships per se, the adjective inductive is meant to capture the fact that observations of the world, specifically concrete interactions between the citizens I observed, come first and guide the theorization, even as some deductive elements, the epistemic framework I just discussed, also shape and orient my observations. I think this is what makes my approach distinctive compared to the more uh, classically analytical and deductive approaches of, say, uh, Sharon Krause or Mar Martin Nussbaum. My main empirical terrain consists of the two citizens' assemblies organized in France thus far, the previously mentioned Citizens' Convention on Climate, which took place in 2019-20, for which I was an observer, and the Citizens' Convention on End of Life, which took place in 2002-2003, and which I actually helped steer. But the intuition that love may be an important political emotion was planted in me just a few days before the third session of the Convention for Climate, when I attended a conference on the Yellow Vests in Aubervilliers near Paris titled Locating the Democratic Experience. I think it's important that I mention this experience first because of the contrast it helps set up between the self-selected assemblies of Yellow Vests and the randomly selected citizens' assemblies. There's love in both, but I'm not sure you get the same kind of truth. The conference focused on the experience of the Yellow Vest on the roundabouts during the months of November 2018 when the movement started, all the way to the summer of 2019 when the movement started to wane. The speakers at the conference, mostly ethnographers and anthropologists, provided rich descriptions of the human bond created in the spaces occupied by the Yellow Vests. They quoted and analyzed observed exchanges, rituals, and unspoken languages. Many of the talk were illustrated by pictures. The portrait of the yellow vest that came through was that of people desperate and grateful for a human connection, who wore yellow jackets to symbolize their membership in the tribe of the oppressed, the angry, the people to whom injustice had been meted. But it was clear that they also came to find acceptance and companionship. Despite the anger that brought them there, the embraced lack of naivety, none of us here are angels, we are not teddy bears, what the yellow vests seemed to experience and come back for in the traffic circles gatherings was, was more generally a form of civic bond and more deeply still a form of love. Sometimes these experiences of love were literal. Some younger protesters did meet their spouses on the traffic circle they had joined. 
But for most, the feeling described was something non-erotic, akin to an intense form of friendship or love. The researchers quoted Yellow Vest as moved by the desire for a different, deeper, more spiritual human relationship at an existential level. I quote, through a word, a gesture, a look, you feel it, you are there, you exist, or someone else. Yellow vests are reinventing a human society. The vest, it's our soul. We are touched in our heart. Every traffic circle has a soul. I felt something vibrating in my gut when I had to get rid of my vest to, ins to escape encirclement by the police. It's as if I got rid of a part of myself. The speaker I borrow uh, the quotes uh, from is the sociologist Karen Clément from um, a research center in France called CRESPA. A few days later, I showed up at the Jena Palace to attend the third session of the Convention for Climate. I had only been able to watch the second one online due to my teaching obligations at Yale, but as soon as I arrived at the convention, I was immediately struck by the difference in tone between the first session, where people had seemed shy, cautious, and vaguely skeptical throughout the weekend, and the first morning of that third session, it felt, and this is the comparison that jumped to me at the time, like a successful third date. Everyone said how happy they were to be back in the building, this room all together. I felt the same way, by the way. There's also a transformative dimension of all this that I'm gonna keep between the lines, but it's definitely there. And I saw it on the researchers who commented on the Yellow Vest experience as well. During the first plenary session, two citizens chosen by lot addressed the whole group to remind them of the importance of what they were doing and why it mattered for future generations. The female representative, Muriel, scanned the rows for the younger member of the assembly, 71-year-old Thomas. She sounded choked up. Thomas, I hope your blonde hair will turn a lovely gray. The whole room felt electric and moved. Shortly after, it was Hulot's turn to address the room, so the former um, minister of ecology. His speech was marked by a lot of bitterness, sadness, disappointment, and regret about his aborted bout in politics as President, as President Macron, minister of ecology. Hulot had spent a lifetime caring about nature, yet he saw it savaged and destroyed a bit more every year. But amid all the hand-wringing and angry denunciations, Hulot said something striking. I quote, What I hated the most about the French National Assembly is the atmosphere. People hate each other over there. Here, you are positive. It gives me your hope. End of quote. Primed by those striking few exchanges, I started paying attention to the markers of love and affection between citizens, even though I was supposed to focus on arguments and expert talk. And in the housing working group, one of the five working subgroups into which the assembly had been divided, I noted the time when an older, retired woman from the Savoie, Marie, stood up and said to the rest of the group, I love you, you are amazing. To which the rest of the group replied, Mary is a beautiful soul. She has a good heart and other sweet, sweet nothings. Then later, when Denise, an elegant older lady who turned out to be a former stutterer, spoke to give her opinion about the morning debate, there was a light tremor in the room. A man said, a man said out loud, you are speaking, Denise, you are growing. Later, I interviewed a young woman named Isabel about the role of experts in the convention. But again, the conversation took a surprising turn towards emotion, emotions. I asked her how she found the atmosphere at the convention. She said, I quote, between us, we are all solidary. We have created a fusional, passionate connection, end of quote. At that point, everything that was happening still felt very new to me. Until the French Convention on, on Climate, I had mostly read and heard about such um, experiments. And that's probably why now, as a direct observer, the warmth and earnestness of the, over the course of the experience surprised me. What happened to the family of French reserve and distance, the Parisian snark, the blasé negative attitude I grew up immersed in? Instead, this felt like a family reunion. The whole day was like that. Lots of physical hugs and touches, greetings by name, laughter, gentle remarks, and jokes. In the few interviews I managed to conduct, despite the mad pace of the convention, the solidarity of the group, the respect and the love were palpable. Finally, a meeting over lunch on Sunday with one particularly vocal member of the convention, Omar, cinched this conclusion. 
He had been immediately noticeable for posing a pointed question during the Q&A with Prime Minister, Prime Minister Edouard Philippe on the first day of the first session of the convention. He also stood out during a plenary in session two when he heckled an expert talking about the carbon tax. Stop treating us like children. In small groups on the Saturday of the third session, he had shut down another expert with a Miss the ex Mrs. the expert, you're spouting nonsense. I was puzzled by the reaction of the other citizens because even as they sometimes pr protested his outbursts, for the most part they gently tried to deflect his anger with humor or calm him down with injunctions such as be positive, Omar, or come on. I was puzzled by their general benevolence, which his abrasive attitude didn't initially clearly justify. Over lunch, he revealed that he was a doctor, a pediatric surgeon, in fact, and that he thought the organizers were pressuring the participants too much with the workload, the long days, and the expectations. He said that he had already seen a participant leave and a couple of others break down in tears. As a doctor, he said he could, of course, take this pressure, but some people were fragile. He sounded protective of his fellow citizens and angry on their behalf. I asked him, You've been banging your fist on the table many times in this assembly. It does not always go well. Can you explain why you are doing that and how you think other people perceive your attitude? He answered, it's because I'm passionate. I'm passionate. I care. At that point, another member of the same working group joined us, a big, friendly, 60-year-old retiring former business owner named Francois. As he sat down, I turned to him and jokingly said, I'm going to ask Francois, what do you think of Omar? Francois replied, without batting an eye, Me? I admire Omar, Omar protested. No, no, don't say that. Francois continued, From the first session I encountered him, I fell in love with him. Je suis tombé amoureux de lui. Not completely aware of what just happened, amused that it was striking how many declarations of love had been made over the last two days and how much love was there was in the air at this convention. Then I realized, to my stupefaction, that in the middle of this busy cafeteria, Omar's eyes were full of tears. Omar said, that's why I'm here. It's for the human exchange, the connection. He very soon could no longer speak. I may or may not have been tearing up too. I took his hand and asked, how many children do you have, Omar? He squeezed my hand back and then he hid his eyes. He showed me with his other hand, five fingers, five children. Still choked up, he explained, two from a previous marriage, two from his new wife's previous marriage, and a new baby with her now, five-year-old. He eventually said, tears streaming down his face, that's why I'm here. Meanwhile, Francois softly said, you can't imagine the hope I have. But he immediately followed with, but it's always disappointed. This was an incredible moment of humanity, perhaps the most profound I experienced at this convention, to me, it, shows, it showed how close love is running under all the apparent anger. Love is just looking for an outlet to express itself. Love also creates conditions from which hope can emerge, even though this hope, as Francois's last remark illustrates, also opens up opens a fear of being betrayed um, and disappointed. I remember reflecting on all this on the plane after that third session and wondered whether this love was maybe the result of the naivete of new beginnings. As soon as they will have to make collective decisions, I thought disagreement and partisan camps will emerge and resentment and suspicion will come to replace love and solidarity, as they always do, don't they? And to some degree, that's partly what happened. Partisan logic re-emerged, bitter battles were fought, but somehow the group stayed whole until the end and voted with large approval margins on the 149 proposals they eventually put forward. So love grew and matured, but didn't die. In fact, it helped navigate the passionate exchanges that continued to take place until the end. Lest you think the Convention on Climate was an exception, let me give you evidence from the second one, the Citizens' Convention on End-of-Life Issues. In October 2022, I received a phone call from the cabinet of the CESUS president. They were inviting me to join the governance committee of a new French Citizens' Convention, this time on assisted dying and euthanasia. I had been traveling to France to merely observe the first convention, so I wasn't about to say no to being given a chance to help pilot a second one, even on a topic that I found dreadful, dreadfully depressing. 
So I said yes to joining a group of 13 other externally appointed experts in charge of steering this deliberative process um, over eight three-day weekends. Contrary to my expectations, the eight weekends of the conventions were intense, but overall an extremely joyful and life-affirming process. I want to focus here on the emotion that occupies us and how it manifested in this second French experience. As in the previous convention on climate, love seemed to emerge organically among the participants and was undeniable. For example, during the second session, when people still hardly knew each other, an older woman spotted a younger one looking, a younger one looking quiet during the break after a difficult story had been shared in their small working group. The older woman, who identified herself as a mother when she told me this story, came to the younger one and asked, can I give you a cuddle? The young woman opened her arms and said, I was waiting for someone to offer. Later in the convention, when people had started developing deeper friendships, an elegant widow from the north of France, who used the opportunity of her weekends in Paris to visit the tomb of her late husband, confided to a peer that she didn't have the courage to go alone that day. Shortly after, 10 other citizens showed up and accompanied her to the cemetery. But in this second assembly, I saw love surging most spectacularly during the last session when we gave participants a chance to share their thoughts about the process they had just gone through. In a private plenary, not filmed, citizens were thus invited by the facilitating team to answer questions like, what was the most important thing for you in what you experienced at the convention? In the end, they mostly ignored the questions and turned this occasion for self-expression into an ad unadulterated love fest. An older gentleman read a text that included the following passages. I live through this convention, one of the most beautiful experiences of my life, and we had become the members of an improbable family born out of the works of chance and necessity. A young man cited French historian Ernest Renan's idea of the common heritage and the everyday plebiscite of the nation that the convention had reaffirmed. Matteo, a 30-something-year-old black man and one of the few citizens who came from the French overseas territories, in his case Guadeloupe, said, I have to be eight hours on a plane one way every other weekend. But that he was coming out of the experience a bigger man with more self-esteem because, as he put it, with this convention, at least once in your life, you feel useful. A woman celebrated the consideration for citizens she had felt throughout. A woman in a headscarf mentioned that sometimes hurtful things had been said during the convention. She wanted to ask for forgiveness if she had offended anyone, and in turn, she was forgiving everyone else. Laughter and applause ensued. Another Muslim participant opposed to assisted suicide thanked the facilitation team for their work, especially with me, who must have been exhausting, and ended with, uh, I love you, to the collective. So it became clear to me at that moment that far from being an epiphenomenon, love was essential to the work accomplished in citizens' assemblies. Let me now illustrate the ways truth and love interacted in the context of these French citizens' assemblies. For one thing, love appeared to play the role of precondition or enabler of the epistemic properties of deliberation. But conversely, an orientation toward the truth seems to have made it possible for people to fall in love with each other, as Omar and Francois did, across partisan divides, religious beliefs, and other differences. By an orientation to truth, I mean a disposition to answer the questions posed by the government in a factually correct and morally and politically relevant way, by contrast, say, with a partisan or political posture that would have consisted in pushing a predetermined agenda on others which is not to say that some people didn't try that. There was, there was, there was always someone or, or a subgroup, but as, as, a, as a group, that's not what was the dominant um, attitude. The first um, impact of love, I would say, is to bring people together and reconcile them with politics. First, the deliberative kind of politics they experience in the convention, but then later, by extension, albeit to a lower extent and not necessarily for long duration, politics as usual. Here, I'd like to share an exchange I had toward the end um, uh, with Jules. 
On the last day of the fifth weekend, as I was leaving the building, I caught Jules, the most visible and perhaps only climate skeptic in the convention, and initially an angry man disaffected with politics. Uh, he had been on TV to explain his climate skepticism to puzzled journalists. He had also spent the first weekend with a frown of disgust and skepticism on his face, taking his carry-on everywhere instead of checking it at the door because, as he explained, he was going to leave any minute now. He ended up staying and was actively involved until the end, even though he remained a committed climate skeptic throughout. He also went on to run for elections in his home region. I interviewed him on the fly as we were both leaving the building that Sunday afternoon, pushed out by the Caesar's ushers. He explained how he hated partisanship, club spirit, and indoctrination. And that is why he had been so very suspicious of the convention to begin with. I remarked that, despite all of this, he was still here and seemed very well integrated to the group. He replied, not only am I well integrated, but I'm passionate. So the conventions, the, con the convention, once I feel free to express what I want and I feel loved, I couldn't help but interrupt him. You feel loved? I asked. He explained. I feel loved by... There are a lot of members who love me very much and whom I love very much. There's a communion of souls. You feel it. Earlier, he had also said that he loved me very much too, which had stunned me. I wish I hadn't interrupted him though, because I never know what he meant to say happened once he felt free and loved. A plausible interpretation, based on the rest of the conversation and his sub subsequent behavior, is that once he felt free and loved, he was able and motivated to participate and contribute to the common good. The second uh, impact of love, I would say, is to keep people engaged over long and difficult periods of time. So it's mo mo it is the motivational fuel that keeps people coming back every session sometimes traveling enormous distances, like Matteo from Guadeloupe, and working intense hours over the weekends when they could have been with their family and friends instead. Love allowed citizens to survive the conflicts and tensions that inevitably flared up over several months. It explains how people who disagree on some fundamental level and have radically different interests and views could come together at the end and vote on common proposals with vast margins of support, close to 80% each time. Finally, love to me is what explains the good and sometimes extraordinary retention rate in that respect of the citizens' conventions. Only about 10% dropped out of the first convention, despite an extraordinary demanding endeavor in terms of time and cognitive effort. The second convention was much better paced, and as a result, our retention rate was truly spectacular. 184 out of 185 people stuck it out to the very end of the process. People stayed despite a tumultuous series of events and some serious setbacks along the way that could have derailed us. A third impact of love is that it enhances people's cognitive faculties. Of course, this is not something I was able to, to observe. This is, it would require to observe people's internal states. But this claim is now supported by abundant empirical research on the relationship between emotions and cognitions. From Damasio's famous studies of brain-damaged patients who lacking the capacity for certain emotions, can't seem to be able to decide properly or at all, to the recent book by political scientist Michael Morell on empathy, which shows empathy is a prerequisite for cognitive processes. Empathy helps us understand the perspective of others better and walk in their shoes, so to speak, thus facilitating convergence, consensus, or at the very least respectful disagreement, all essential to political decision making. Love is one of the emotions most likely to generate empathy for others and therefore can be seen as directly instrumental to the quality of the collective deliberation and decision-making process. Fourth, love makes people more receptive to the forceless force of the better argument. I have written at length about the epistemic properties of deliberation among free and equals, especially when they are chosen by lot rather than through elections or any other method. But what strikes me now is that this deliberation would probably not work or lead, to a set, or lead to a satisfactory outcome if it was not activated and kept alive by the affection between participants. From this point of view, I now think that um, the movie 12 Angry Men, on which I relied in democratic reason to model the dynamics of deliberation, 
is not such a plausible rendition of what's, what must go on in successful juries, since it is marred by so much anger, bad faith, and distrust between the jurors. Extreme drama makes for good TV, but it's not representative of what I saw happen in reality, at least in the context of larger groups involving both genders. In reality, people are more receptive to arguments they disagree with from people they trust, and they tend to trust more, peop more people they love. The forceless force of the better argument, enabled by love and trust among the participants, is, in my view, what led the convention members to disregard a carbon tax as a solution to the problem of greenhouse gas emissions, even though a small, a small majority was in favor at the beginning. That small majority, as identified through researchers' questionnaires, was arguably swayed by the vocal minority that immediately protested any mention of a carbon tax by expert witnesses. The minority's arguments against the carbon tax were that a carbon tax was a violation of social justice in the way that it disproportionately punishes the peri-urban working class. The fact that through their deliberations, they had discovered myriad other ways to address the problem of greenhouse gas emissions, at least 149, it turns out. The fact that they couldn't afford to see the first French citizens' assembly look like it was being manipulated to validate President Macron's failed policy. And the fact that experts became more and more divided on the subject as times went by. Because another thing that I could go into is that it's transformative of experts as well. They do lose their confidence and some of their arrogance, and they they are also changed by the process. The small majority originally in favor of a carbon tax likely chose to drop the topic because they were swayed by such arguments in a way they might not have been if they hadn't trusted the minority viewpoint. In the Convention on End of Life, love is arguably also what made the majority receptive to the minority's idea of making palliative care such a big part of their final recommendations. The majority clearly had the numbers to ignore the minority viewpoint entirely if they had wanted to. But they cared about them, and partly because they cared so much, they recognized the validity of their proposal, which was indeed a smart way to minimize the likelihood that people would need to require assisted dying or even a form of euthanasia in the first place. The best example to my mind, however, comes from an assembly I did not observe myself, the 2012 Irish Citizens' Assembly on Marriage Equality. Irish Citizens' Assemblies are sometimes described as a jewel in the crown of deliberative assemblies because they have been conducted successfully on multiple issues and connected to national referenda that led to important constitutional changes. I borrow here an example from the first one. This assembly allowed two radically opposed people and beyond them arguably an entire country, to come closer to what I would argue is a form of moral, and at the very least political truth, through the power of love-enabled deliberation. On the one hand, we have Finbar O'Brien, a disgruntled Irish voter, a loner, someone dis disaffected with politics. Finbar is someone with a history of abuse. He had come to confuse, as a result, pedophilia and homosexuality. On the, other on the other hand, we have Chris Lyons, a young gay man with a history of being bullied by homophobes of all kinds. Here is how a journalist who tracked the story down, a story that won the journalist an award, reports on it. I quote, Finbar doesn't like arriving late, which means he often arrives early. He takes a seat. Moments later, a young man approaches the table. Two, piercing, two piercings glint in his lip, and his head is shaved on the left and right, the hair on top sticking straight up. Finbar can see that the man has put on eye makeup and painted his fingernails, each one a different color of the rainbow. This man is gay, Finbar thinks. And the feeling in his chest, which was largely one of excitement, is supplanted by a familiar, overpowering sensation, panic. My first thought was, I'm going to throw him out the window. My thoughts were out of control." End of quote. The young man simply triggers Finbar's childhood trauma. Meanwhile, here is what Chris is thinking as he encounters Finbar for the first time. Quote, really, this is the first chap I meet here? I saw him looking at my fingernails, which clearly made him uncomfortable. I'd probably overdone it with the gay look. 
mohawk, eyeliner, fingernails. I suppose I could have gone with less. I looked at him and he stared off into space. So I thought, okay, gentlemen's agreement. If you don't look at me, I don't look at you. I could see it all clearly anyway. Older Irishmen, I'd spent my whole life fighting against these people and their values, repeatedly having to say, you know, I'm not a pervert, I'm a person whose life has value. End of quote. So here we are. What kind of deliberation, understanding, and consensus can we expect between a man who thinks men who like other men and paint their nails are pedophiles, and a man who knows old white dudes hate him and wish him dead? Yet here is how David Farrell and Jane Souter, in their book Reimagining Democracy, recount what happened toward the end of the weekend when gay marriage was debated. I quote, Toward the end of the weekend, one of the citizen members, Finn Barr, who had not spoken before, stood up to make a personal statement. He spoke clearly, but with some emotion. It was obvious to all in the room that he wanted to make a strong point. A kind of electric potential charged the air as everyone seemed to sense the nature of what he was about to say. He had been abused as a small child, he said, and the experience had affected his attitudes toward gay people. Here, in this room, he felt it was important to declare his view. He had no problem at all with the proposal for gay marriage. The hair rose on the back of our necks, applause broke out, members rose to their feet, clapping. End of quote. So Finn went from wanting to throw Chris out of the window for speaking up for his right to love, and Chris went from fearing older white men like Finbar to finding him one of his greatest supporters. What happened? What happened, I think, is that these two people became friends little by little through the process of learning together and bonding over a common goal. Without bonding, there would have been no learning and no chance for either of them to come a little closer to the truth about each other, about the nature of homosexuality, and arguably, though by no means certainly, the way a democratic liberal society true to its core values should treat all its members regardless of sexual orientation. This brings me to my next and fifth point about the impact of love on truth. Love is the emotion that helps people work together towards a solution that works for both majorities and minorities, even as they will inevitably disagree with crucial elements of the solution. This is a lesson more visible in the case of the Convention on End of Life, which was traversed by a radical value disagreement from beginning to end. From the very beginning, it appeared that around 80% of the group was in favor of liberalizing the law, while a group of 20% was radically opposed to crossing the line towards inflicting death as care. And yet, over time, a form of consensus emerged. The citizens' final report, along with their 65 proposals, was approved by an overwhelming 92% of the convention. 76% percent of participants voted for a change in the law to introduce a French model for assisted suicide and euthanasia. But a large chunk of the report also focused on what the minority had been arguing for all along, better access to quality palliative care at the end of life, as a way to save people from having to consider tragic choices. On the last day of the convention, the informal leader of the minority stood up to say, I want to thank the 75% for giving us 50% of the speaking time and 50% of the final document. To us on the governance committee, this reconciliation of majority and minority was the biggest achievement. I have so far only talked about the way love works as a truth enabler in the context of citizens' assemblies. Love helps citizens successfully and productively engage in deliberation, giving them the best possible shot at figuring out common solutions to common problems. But conversely, it seems to me that it is their orientation towards truth and their common goal that created the conditions under which love was able to emerge between them as they came to trust one another. This orientation is distinct from the antagonist and winning-oriented um, disposition that characterizes partisan environments, and electoral politics more generally. So as a sixth claim, I want to argue that truth orientation opens up people to the possibility of love across many divides. The evidence I have for this claim is more limited as well as indirect, but still, I think, uh, worth considering. It comes from what happened in the Convention on End of Life after the Governance Committee, which I was part of, decided to allow the formation of opinion groups, 
So opinion groups is basically groups that are based on self-selection. We let people go to the groups that uh, they agree with. We had become worried that the minorities against assisted dying and euthanasia were not being sufficiently heard. And some of the representatives that asked for permission to meet in groups of like-minded people to find strength in numbers and work on their arguments together. Of course, we got worried that if we allowed that, um, it would go against the spirit of the whole exercise, which was based on random selection and sought to avoid the factionalism and divisions current in electoral politics. But we proceeded with it anyway, and by the fifth session, people were allowed to, to join various opinion groups, including minority groups opposed to assisted dying, euthanasia, or both. Initially, the creation of these groups felt like a spectacular success. Members of the minorities became much more vocal, their arguments started taking more space in the plenaries, and as, as already mentioned, the um, woman who represented the minority at the end said that um, they, they clearly felt comfortable speaking and, and felt seen. Unfortunately, interviews conducted since then reveal a serious love of collective harmony inside the convention after the opinion groups were created, or at least made to last for too long. Further, when directly asked about the opinion groups, the previously mentioned minority leader said that despite the gratitude she had wanted to express publicly with her speech, she recognized that the opinion groups had substituted a logic of winning against the initial logic of collaboration and had entrenched minority and majority opinion groups as warring sides, she said. These were strong words. Love, she implied, started fading the minute an impartial orientation towards truth was replaced by a partisan orientation towards winning. This probably means that an orientation towards the truth is in itself a precondition for love to emerge in a given group, and one that needs care, constant work, and nurturing. If this conditionality of love and truth orientation is true, it would seem to explain the fact that, as Nicolas Hulot recounted uh, of the National Assembly, People hate each other over there. The fact is that partisan politics is a zero-sum game pitting one, one camp against another or many camps against many others, creating warring sides rather than loving solidarity even among differently-minded people. It will also make sense of the fact that the bond between citizens in the Convention on Climate did not survive being transplanted into the so-called Association of the 150 which constituted a group started toward the end of the process by a few citizens who wanted to continue the work of the convention after it ended. Shortly after its creation, the association started to fall apart because of various ego battles, ego battles and an incapacity to resolve disagreements. The leaders of that association had chosen to reintroduce the logic of election and the factional spirit elections reintroduced ended up eventually undermining and killing the association. Let me turn now to objections. A politics that makes room for love is not only possible, I found out, but probably necessary for people to learn, deliberate productively, and solve problems together, including sometimes against their own interests, preferences, and deeply held beliefs. It is also profoundly transformative of individuals and people around them, giving them a sense of community and a reason for hope. I now believe that citizens' assemblies offer us a model and an inspiration for what politics could also be about. Politics need not be just about conflicts of interest or fundamental values, although it's certainly also about that. It, did not, it need not be only about power. It can also be a caring search for truth, the common good, and common solutions to common problems. But I do want to consider objections. Um, so first, there's an objection to the generalizability of what I saw at the French conventions. Maybe the only reason why love was able to flourish was because the convention members did not have real power. They did not have to decide anything, nor did they have to be kept accountable to the nation for it. Presumably, if the stakes had been higher, the potential for conflict would have risen exponentially and maybe cruelly divided the convention members. But in the context of the first Convention on Climate, the stakes were high. At the very least, the citizens believed so. And that's because the president had promised them at the very beginning that he would take their proposals directly to regulation, a referendum, or a parliamentary debate. He said there would be no filter. 
They took him seriously and many buckled under the pressure, actually. Later, the group agonized over whether or not to choose a referendum as an athlete for their proposals. It's precisely because the stakes were so high that the majority decided not to go to the referendum and instead to hand over their baby, the 500-page report, to Parliament. So even if they did not have formal constitutional powers to decide, the 150 probably felt as empowered as citizens can be in the context of our contemporary democracies. The fact that their love for each other survived that amount of pressure is at least promising. A second objection worries that love may not have only good effects on deliberation, even as it seemingly did in the two observed cases I reported on. Love is blind, as the saying goes, and love's, love makes people blind. Can we not suspect that love can also derail deliberation away from the truth by creating a false consensus, by pushing people to bury their differences and go along with the group? It's possible, of course, for love to be blind and lead one astray. This is where the institutional design matters. I doubt that love was ever completely blind in the French conventions because of the composition of the assembly and the diversity of profiles brought together by random selection. This diversity arguably worked as a counter-effect to the homogenizing or polarizing effects of love. By contrast, the love that was present on the roundabouts occupied by the yellow vest may have plausibly led to a re reinforcement of previously held views about politics as it brought together people with similar backgrounds and frustrations. In a context of greater sociological and cognitive homogeneity, deliberation, additionally, additionally entirely unstructured uh, and unfacilitated deliberation, is perhaps less likely to lead toward truth about the common good, as not all relevant information and perspectives are available or tapped. And that's not a criticism of, the, of those movements, by the way. I just don't think that we can expect the same things from these kind of uh, meetings. Similarly, love did not lead minorities to self-censor in the context of the French assemblies. On the contrary, the more integrated and respected they became, the more loved they felt, the freer their expressions of radical dissent were. As I recounted above, the ideolo ideological minorities in the Convention on End of Life contributed their truth to the deliberations only after we, on the Governance Committee, managed to create the conditions for trust between the groups to emerge and recognition so that they could then anticipate that their dissenting views would be received with respect, even, as, uh, even if, as I also have to acknowledge, that came at a cost in terms of collective harmony. So there's, there are trade-offs there that I'm not entirely sure how, um, how to adjudicate. Additionally, love was not all that forgiving either. Omar's disruptive interruptions were tolerated while still being judged for what they were. Occasionally, he was booed into silence. Generally, though, love at the convention took the form of humor, teasing, and sometimes rougher roasting. Instead of putting aside their more disruptive companions, the other members of the convention used an array of softer techniques to preserve the social fabric between them. Another objection worries about the conditions under which we can hope to see this kind of love emerge. Maybe they're too rarefied. There's indeed something special about citizens' assemblies compared to other settings. I think one reason love is more likely to flourish in the context of a randomly selected body than an elected assembly is that in the context of randomly selected assemblies, people can to a degree overcome the barriers artificially created by status inequalities and partisan affiliations, among other things. Even as people figured out over time, of course, who was rich or poor, who was progressive or conservative, a climate skeptic or not, for or against assisted dying, these labels were not part of the way people identified initially and came to know each other, socialize and befriend each other. They are identified only, at least at first, through their first name and region of origin. This allowed friendships to bloom between people from very different backgrounds who might not have been so easily inclined to have a conversation with one another. The friendship survived the discovery of differences between them, at least in the context of the assembly. The objection that the chemistry of citizens' assembly is too rare an occurrence, however, only applies if we think electoral politics cannot be systematically complemented, perhaps even replaced entirely, by sortition-based politics. Even if we accept that enough of politics is about 
power pure conflicts of values and interests, etc. So that we need to maintain room for electoral politics. Um, and the vitriol and hatred that comes with it, why couldn't we also carve out some institutionalized permanent space for a different kind of politics, more deliberative, more loving, and more truth and common good oriented? But then another objection is one of scalability. Even assuming I'm right that deliberation under a condition of love does have epistemic properties that can help the group approximate political truth, how are we going to extend such benefits to the scale of nations? Time is an issue as well. Does the fast pace of politics give us the time to create the tight-knit civic love of deliberative settings? It's certainly true that running a few citizens' assemblies here and there won't be enough. But the idea would be to institutionalize them at all levels of the polity, as well as in organizations we do not yet deem political, but probably should, like school, universities, hospitals, and even corporations. Liz Anderson would agree with me. As more and more people participate in them, as they become a normal part of politics, their ethos would likely spread to society at large through the coverage of media, word of mouth, and something like social capillarity, if you will. It is striking to me that in the nine months that the French Citizens' Convention on Climate existed, it changed the attitude of observers towards it. It went from, first of all, a focus group to, a, to from being a focus group that nobody knew about to becoming a political actor. And the attitude toward that political actor went from ignorance or hostility to support. By June 2020, 70% of the population had heard of the convention, and three French people out of five said they thought the convention had the legitimacy to put forward proposals in the name of the larger public. When the second French convention was announced, the media coverage was mostly positive from day one. By contrast, the first convention had been attacked left and right for months. In the last few years, the popularity of citizens' assemblies has, in fact, grown all over Europe. Finally, if we can count on the power of imagination as mediated through the media and institutions to make a group of people who have never met feel like they are part of the same national community, as Benedict Anderson famously, famously theorized, why can't that same power of imagination not convey some of the love present in citizens' assemblies to the larger public? It might be diluted and weaker than the emotion that I saw in these assemblies, but it might still be worth feeling, and it might still have some of the effects I um, documented. Let me conclude. In this lecture, I have tried to defend the place of both truth and love as relevant concepts for a modern, deliberative, democratic politics. The novel claim I made here is about the symbiotic relation between the search for truth in deliberative democracy and the emotion of love as a political passion that has the power to ignite the epistemic properties of deliberation in the context of citizens' assemblies, while being in turn nurtured as the beautiful byproduct of a collective search for truth. If correct, these claims about the connection between truth and love may go some way toward explaining why our post-truth political systems are both so dysfunctional in general and vulnerable to dis disinformation, lies, and fake news in particular. It's not just that there's not enough proper deliberation happening in the system, it's also that there's not enough love to make proper deliberation possible to begin with. And there's neither enough love nor enough deliberation because political actors are governed by a logic of winning at any cost rather than an orientation to the truth. A politics of love, I conclude, is one way, perhaps indeed the only way we can ho hope to unlock, as Du Bois puts it, the collective wisdom that the rulers of human beings must have from the bosoms of individual souls. A politics of love would consist of taking into account and centering emotions, love first and foremost, in the way we structure deliberation among citizens so as to enhance both the epistemic properties of deliberation and strengthen the bonds among citizens. I'm not convinced personally that any of this can happen within the bounds of what we know as electoral politics, which centers instead on ambition and a desire for power that trumps anything else. A politics of love may thus point towards a more radical reform agenda, which would involve questioning almost all the design choices behind our so-called electoral democracies. Let me now return to and end with Romeo and Juliet, and the hatred between the Montagues and Capulets. In that play, as already noted, 
love does not work. It does not lead to truth or peace. Instead, peace is ultimately achieved through a catastrophic event. The double suicide of Romeo and Juliet, which finally brings the families together. A better alternative would have been to let love flourish. First, the erotic love between Romeo and Juliet, of course, but also by choice and design, between their fam the love between their families. Rather than being submitted to reconciliation by the loss of their beloved kids, the two families could have pursued the path of love consciously. There are additional lessons that one can derive from Shakespeare, which seem to me crucially related to this idea of centering love in our democratic politics, especially if we care about the truth. If we want to center love, we should start by, one, taking the weapons out of politics, both literal and metaphorical, blades, guns, and crucially, money. Two, we should start listening to women more. There's a feminist agenda, I believe, in Shakespeare, um, at least in that play, since Juliet seems to me the only true innocent, and I don't think she gets a fair hearing. Three, we should be open to the possibility of being wrong and changing our minds. Um, the beauty of citizens' assemblies is that they allow for, three, for all three things. Citizens' assemblies are, by design, less susceptible to the corruption of money than electoral politics ever will be. Citizens' assemblies include 50% of women by construction, including young and idealist girls like Juliet, whereas electoral politics struggles to bring in enough women, even with quotas, and end up pushing to power a very unrepresentative sample of the female population anyway. Finally, citizens' assemblies are places where people don't need to posture and pretend to be all tough, and where men can say, I love you, to each other, and learn to be friends, even when they start full of hate and prejudice towards each other. Such places both permit and require an openness to others' perspectives, lived experiences and concerns, and a willingness to experiment with ideas and changes, and change one's mind. How much can we extrapolate from Shakespeare and citizens' assemblies to the world of politics as we know it, both nationally and internationally? I'm not perfectly sure, of course, but I'm hopeful. And since we seem to have reached the point of diminishing returns with the politics of hate anyway, what do we have to lose in trying it? Thank you. So I guess I'll start us off. So thanks for this. One curious feature of love, it seems to me, is that it bends towards partiality, so that I'm more motivated to favor the interests of the people I love rather than those that I don't. I'm more emotionally vulnerable to the people I love rather than those that I'm not, and so on. And so one sort of worry with the kind of love and politics view is that might this bend us towards a kind of nationalism or a kind of partiality towards the people who end up making it into the democratic <laughs> chamber, but maybe not other societies or other states. And maybe another way of making the point is if we live in this kind of interconnected global world, is love and politics going to be good for this kind of world? Or is it going to take us to engaging with everybody? Or is it just going to move us towards a kind of love for fellow citizens who end up making it into the chamber, but not in favoring their interests rather than those um, who don't, who may be across other borders? Thanks. No, this is a very good question, very legitimate one. Of course, you know, one of the manifestations of love could be patriotism uh, or nationalism, as you said. Uh, which some, some of you know some of which have problematic aspects. I think it depends, as I said, on the institutional design and also who you bring in the room. Um, so, for example, I keep saying citizens' assemblies. But the reality is that nobody checks whether you're a French citizen or not in these spaces. If you answer the phone, um, you know, the the, the polling institute um, calls random phone numbers, generates random phone numbers, and then calls them. If you pick up the phone, nobody's going to check. Uh, whether you're uh, an undocumented immigrant or something, and, and you can go. In fact, in, in the French uh, citizens' 
assembly that we organized at the local level, I, um, I met an Iranian, uh, an Iranian citizen. She wasn't French. Um, there was a Syrian refugee, I think, in one of the conventions at the national level. So actually, um, it, it's not love the problem. <laughs> the problem is like who's in the perimeter of, of that emotion. And the idea with citizens' assemblies is that you try to, yeah, if, if you, you know, ideally, of course, you bring everyone. But to the extent that you cannot, then at least you bring a representative sample that, that helps people develop uh, feelings and, and, and emotions and, you know, um, empathy towards people they would never meet otherwise. So I'm not, um, the politics of love that I'm advocating for is not, is trying to not be too naive about this, but try to think in terms of institutional design and the specific context of these assemblies as places where you can actually de-bias people and you can um, educate people and, and across these kinds of differences. So that's what makes me hopeful. Thanks. Hi, I was wanting to ask a little bit more about these citizen assemblies and how, I guess my concern is, is this a self-selecting sample in some way? Um, is, um, how do they, like you say it's random, but presumably these people have to be willing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm assuming they're compensated in some way, yes. because otherwise they couldn't really do, put all that into it. So I was just wondering if you could say more about that and whether you considered whether there are some self-selecting qualities which are importantly contributing to what you witnessed in those, in those groupings that we might not see in general. So it's a very good question. Yes, there's, a, there's an element of self-selection because right now n no one has the political, you could say, courage <laughs> to impose this as mandatory participation. I don't think we are there yet. But yes, if we want to reach the full potential of those assemblies or answer your question, we'd have to be able to uh, run a citizen's assembly where once, you know, like jury duty, when, once you get the phone call, you're on. You have to go, unless, of course, there are extenuating circumstances and such. That's not the case for now because we're still at the early stage of these processes and because also I think it's, it's not, f it's not um, fully compatible with the very liberal sort of conception of citizenship we have where you know, all you are asked ask to do is vote regularly and maybe go to jury duty and even that you can easily get out of. But would the results be fundamentally different if people, um, if there wasn't this selection bias? I, I tend to think not because um, I saw the kind of people that were brought in these assemblies and there were homeless people in the first convention that were accompanied by special associations and, and it's true, I, I think the, the, the homeless person didn't last very long, but I think it was very important that they were there for a while as they were discussing, discussing housing options and, and renters versus owners and, and, you know, and policies around those questions. When you have to look someone in the eye and, and they tell you about their experience living, you know, without a house, without a home, you cannot quite make the same decisions you would when you're just among politicians who, who don't have that sort of uh, visceral phenomenal degree of experience. So how do you increase the take-up rate? Well, I think first of all, you educate people about these assemblies because for the first convention, when the pollsters called, they got hanged up on a lot. <laughs> so, you know, they thought it was a scam. They didn't believe it, it was real. Second time, it was easier because people had heard of the convention the first time around. Um, and you, of course you pay them. So they were paid 80 euros a day, which was roughly 2,500, 2,700 euros for the whole thing, which is a full month for, uh, maybe more than a full month for, for many French uh, people. Uh, you reach out, you, you know, there are all kinds of ways you can help. You, you try to, uh, you know, plan for childcare, things like that. So mistake that were made in my view is that um, for childcare, the CESU, for example, reimbursed upon the presentation of a receipt. And I think that's idiotic and that they should just pay, they do just do give a cash transfer because of course women do not hire always a professional babysitter. They just ask their niece or someone in the family and then they'll have to return the favor and they'll never get compensated for that. Um, the men on their time later. So I think, um, some, some people I respect say that we could probably increase the take-up rate easily just through these measures to 20%, so that people, you know, 20% of the people asked show up. Can we do more? I don't know, but then we have to remember compared to what, right? Uh, 
the representativeness of, of elected assemblies is not that great. Um, mass referenda do not always have great turnout either. So, you know, all in all, compared to other options, it's, it is to me a, a still a very attractive proposition. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I wanted to bring up the, the first objection that um, you uh, responded to, which was about this idea that there's no love in the Assemblée Nationale uh, because it's, um, the stakes are higher for real politicians, right, who are passing policy. Um, and I wanted to sort of maybe modify that objection to say something like, um, it seems like the structures that get built once a system is in place and once a system has power for an extended period of time um, seem to be the problem, right? So because we have an elected, uh, we have elected officials, they then have to answer to in interest groups, the electorate, lobbyists, and um, every move they make has to be a strategic move. And in contrast, the Citizens' Assembly at least for now, um, because it's not really widespread, doesn't have that whole structure of power uh, that's built around it. Um, so my worry, I guess, is that it seems like the love part gets overridden once there's power in the long term and once a democratic structure is in place um, for an extended period of time, um, that's when the love seems to disappear. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how, how we could protect the love that seems to flourish in the citizens' assemblies um, from these long-term effects of power. Great, so I, I tend to think that the reason why uh, elected assemblies um, don't have much love in them, it, it, it's not primarily because of this um, uh, of the duration, or I, I think it's truly um, the partisanship that, that it's built on and the electoral me method of selection that basically means you come in with a label, I'm on the left, I'm on the right, and, and you're kind of like my, you know, it's, it's an agonistic view of politics, it's like we are, we're, we're, we're um, adversaries. It's very hard once you're in that mindset to um, love your adversary. You can respect them, but loving them is a, is a big ask. Um, so you don't have that in the Citizens' Assembly, which is a, a plus. Now, of course, there's a big question in, in my world uh, about what does it do to ordinary citizens to become elevated to this position of power, and maybe if they stay for too long, say, more than a year, because I think the longest that, uh, that I know of is nine months, maybe it will get to the head. And I would say, yes, of course, it will get to the heads of some. I mean, definitely the person who started the in my view, the person who started the uh, association of the 5, uh, 150, 150 that I talked about was himself a politician type. He, he got flattered by the attention, by the, by the way the journalists thought him out. He wrote a book. Um, it was called, actually, I Citizen, which kind of like goes against the whole purpose of the, the we they were trying to create. Sure, the question is, how many will be affected and how bad will it be? And, um, and I'm not sure it would be so bad because... Many of them don't really crave that kind of attention. They, they, they just don't they, don't, they don't, they don't seem to be transformed by it and they kind of want to keep, they, they kind of know that the point of this is to stay grounded. Um, so, uh, again, there's no guarantee. We would, we would have to see and try, but remember also that there's rotation built, built in, the, in the concept, right? Like, they're not going to become professional politicians and stay there forever. Once their term is over, they, they go back to their lives. It's actually very hard for them, I should say. There's a, there's a sort of psychological um, depressurization or something that happens once you're done with the excitement of this group. And, and, um, and so we had to have psychologists on site to, 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 to deal also with the issues around euthanasia and assistance because they were hard to process, but also with the aftermath of you know, when the convention is over. It, it is, um, there are a lot of elements that we don't know about, like what does it do to the psyche of these people? And one, one argument also that's often brought up is the idea that, well, the minute they enter this um, assembly, they're no longer ordinary citizens. But it, does, it, it, it depends on what you mean by ordinary citizens. It, of course they'll know more, of course they'll have more access to experts, of course they'll have more access, access to politicians, so they won't be 
exactly like the people they were prior to entering that space. But they still like Gerard from Normandy, right? They come equipped with a certain life story and cognitive sort of, you know, talents and modules, and, and that's what they bring to the processing of information, the, the information that they are presented with. And that's very, very valuable in my, in my mind, and I don't see that changing over time, so. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, I have two questions, like one about love and another one about the truth. I think like in comparison like to art, um, about love, I was like reading about like Aaron and Baldwin, like they also have like this conversation about what love, and um, at the end Baldwin landed on love, whereas like Aaron said like love is apolitical, is not uh, not good, and I was trying to figure out like why that happened, like why uh, Baldwin would say like love, and whereas Aaron cannot, but then I figure out that you know um, Baldwin can say like love white people, but then Aaron cannot say love the Nazis, and she would be totally wrong if she did that. Um, and also it's because like, I guess like racism is largely brought by like fear and ignorance, whereas um, for Nazis it's not like, Aaron said like, uh, they're fearless, they don't care if they're alive or they're dead, I guess like that's my question about love. And about truth, also com in comparison like to her time, like the totalitarian regime and the Nazis completely based, like grounded on this idea of truth and this eugenics. And that is what um, motivates her to, you know, say truth is bad. And also I think in one of the lectures she asked like her audiences, like what if um, the Nazis are right about their uh, biology or eugenics. What brings people together? What brings the Jewish and the non-Jewish people together? Um, during that time, um, she landed on friendship. And that um, is really similar to your discussion. So I guess like my question is like, what is the difference between like truth and love? And in Arndt's language, maybe like um, common world and friendship in politics. Um, okay, so I, I didn't quite get the, the gist of the question, but I, I just wanted to pick up on, on something you've said about how totalitarian regimes are based on, on um, uh, appeals to truth, and uh, indeed that's a gist of um, Anna Arendt's sort of suspicion toward the, any kind of truth claims in politics, and it's the same suspicion that animates um, uh, roles, the, the later roles, epistemic abstinence, right? He, he wasn't so suspicious in theory of justice, but somehow later in political liberalism he's starting to replace, he doesn't want to go near truth, he talks about the reasonable and reasonableness. But I, I'm just very convinced by Josh Cohen's argument that it's not truth the cause of, or truth claims that are the cause of our disagreements, it's just, it's just the way through which we, exp we express our disagreements. And so you can replace true with reasonable, at the end of the day we're going to still have a disagreement about what's more reasonable. And, and, and so the semantic around this is, is just, that's not where the, the problem lies. Um, so that's why I'm less uh, hesitant or you know, uh, reluctant to, to use the vocabulary of truth. And I think the you know, scarecrow of totalitarianism and, and, and the 20th century sort of ideology is, uh, shouldn't sort of freeze are thinking about uh, about you know the importance of having something to 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 direct ourselves towards something to um, argue for. That's that's my my position. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, also talking about uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, I I want to I'm wondering about your uh, sort of the way you've responded to her initial worry about truth leading to coercion. Um, and I wonder if this worry of coercion just slips back in through the back door when we're talking about love. Um, so you've allowed for a plurality of truths. Um, however, I'm wondering yeah, if there's a plurality of loves, it seems like oftentimes people can use love as a justification for their uh, manipulation or subjugation or uh, just plain hurt 
uh, the, those that they love. They might not even do those that with people that uh, they would not love. Uh, they only do it to those they love. So I'm wondering if when you speak of love, you're referring to like a very specific unitary concept or if you're allowing for a plurality of love that might um, allow for this sort of more toxic element come in. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I tend to think that the intense feeling of affection for something or someone is unitary, but then you can sort of channel it the right way or the wrong way. Um, so, you know, I, I tend to think of it, I suppose it's kind of a human assumption that if you want to fight a, a, a passion, you need another passion, that you, you will not necessarily be able to, to fight the bad passion through reason alone, right? So it's, so sure, love can itself be used for nefarious you know, uh, purposes to manipulate someone, to, to coerce, um, although would that still be love in that case? I'm trying to imagine a scenario where that... It, it can animate someone to, to, to do things they shouldn't be doing. That is true. Um, so I'm not sure I would want to necessarily pluralize indefinitely, the, 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 the sort of give you a typology of all the kinds of love, because right now I think it suffices that I, I sort of talk about the institutional design around it. Um, and, you know, having facilitators make sure that uh, people have roughly equal speaking times or equal access to the plenaries or that, that can take care of some um, exuberant forms of, you know, um, uh, you know, love, I guess, from, from participants who care, like, like, like Omar. Omar is a good example. He really cares. He's just a little overwhelming and maybe he's a little patronizing even. Um, but so that doesn't mean it's bad per se, it just means that the effects of that can be bad or good depending on how you channel that, that, that feeling. Um, does, that, does that help? Thank you. So I'm pretty persuaded both by the thought that the citizen assemblies facilitate love and that this is something that has epistemic benefits, but I'm curious about your thoughts on like a potential kind of epistemic cost uh, for the love facilitated, which is, so in a good ideal friendship, you should like be challenging your friends when you think that they're wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But as a psychological reality, it seems like if you have strong fellow feeling towards someone, you're one, less likely to challenge them even when you think they're wrong, two, probably less likely to even be thinking of ways in which they might be wrong, less likely to kind of be receptive to ways they might be mistaken, more likely to be kind of taken in by their thoughts. And I noticed that in a lot of the examples you were talking about, when people were being very hostile and challenging, later through the assembly, it was always towards the experts who seemed to be kind of like an out group to a certain extent for the people within the assembly themselves. And so a potential kind of epistemic cost might be uh, a kind of group think emerging within the citizens assembly itself, given the uh, fellow feeling that you're talking about. So I'm curious your thoughts on that potential epistemic cost. Mm -hmm. Great. So it's, I guess, the objection of love is blind. Uh, but um, it's not the only emotion that's present in the, in the assembly. And remember that people are also motivated by the search for truth. So it has sort of a counterbalancing effect, especially in a diverse group. And it's just not true that they were hostile on, or you know, combative, let's put it that way, only towards the outside group of experts. They were very combative amongst each other as well, but in this like, you know, um, playful and, um, and, and respectful way. And sometimes it crossed lines. I'm not saying this didn't happen. Um, and I, I quoted this woman who said that she had been hurt and hurtful and she would ask for forgiveness because it got really tense, you know? It got tense also because in the French context, you know, the 20% who opposed euthanasia and assisted dying usually, I mean, not usually, but oftentimes they came from a religious perspective. And in a secular context and in a somewhat anti-clerical culture that the French have, 
they didn't know, they didn't know the, the people on, on the other side didn't know what to make of religious arguments. In fact, uh, on the governance committee, we, we, we had to d decide amongst ourselves, do we bring religious leaders or not? Is that part of the Republican conversation? And of, we decided, of course it is, and so we brought them in, and we had the whole range of religious leaders come and address the citizens, but some of the citizens were not happy about it. They thought, it's outside public reason, you know? And so that those tensions played out in small groups, um, and I, I didn't get a feeling that love led people to censor themselves. If anything, as I said, it was the opposite. As they loved each other more and respected each other more, the, the arguments became more and more explicit and frontal and the conversations more intense. So I know in romantic relations it can go the other way, but when does it go the other way? When you're, when you're losing yourself, when you're losing your sense of identity and your self-respect, then you cave in, then you, 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 you go too far maybe in, um, in subordinating, subordinating your will to the will of the other person. <clears throat> but the whole point of this assembly is that everybody's an e equal. And it's, it's sort of... A, expressed and manifested and, and reiterated in every decision, every, every institutional design decision that, we, that, that, that is made. And, and I think it helps people overcome that. They don't want to hurt feelings, but they have something to say. So they'll say it anyway. Thank you. Hi, um, well, thank you so much for your, thought, uh, for your talk. As you were explaining the love uh, that you witness in these assemblies. Uh, it sounded very familiar and similar to what I've read from uh, accounts of uh, governing assemblies in Rojava, for example, oh, yes. uh, which is the autonomous region in north of Syria. Yeah. I was wondering, what are your thoughts about the relation of this form of civic love that you're talking about to the love, care, and cooperation that anarchism relies on? Ah, very interesting. I, I was recently on a dissertation on uh, a, def a defense of municipalism, and uh, so I have some thoughts, actually. I, um, it, it's fascinating. I find that completely amazing, what they've done in, uh, in Syria, in Rojava, and great admiration. Um, I don't know enough, to be honest. I, I, you know, I, I don't think there's... The dissertation as, uh, as sort of uh, advice was very theoretical, and I, I would have liked to, to on, on Rojava specifically, you know, it's very inaccessible, so you don't really know how it works. So I can see that it works in small contexts, which was um, the, 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 the object of study of that dissertation, like at the city level or something. Um, in Rojava, it's larger scale. So the idea is that there are no representatives. It's all based on assemblies of self-selected participants. Um, and when they have to make decisions at the, at the higher level, they send uh, delegates, uh, usually a man and a woman, to uh, speak for the group, but without the ability of making decisions, of departing from the strict mandate that's given to them. So it's a combination of direct democracy and uh, you know, imperative mandates at the, at, the fed, at the confederal level. It seems to be working for them. I, I have to say I, I'm a little skeptical because my experience of self-selection is that it's always the same people who volunteer to, to represent others. Um, it's people who tend to like power more, who tend to be more male. I know in Rojava it's not the case because they have this strict feminist sort of a um, principle that encourages women to go, but then what kind of women are we sending? Are they truly representative? And how do, how do you scale something like that? I, um, I, you know, it, it just seems, and it also requires that you're constantly participating in meetings, it becomes, it's becoming your whole life. What I like about the, the lotocratic alternative, if you want, is that uh, it is uh, representing and being represented in turn, so it frees you when you're not called to duty to, to lead your life. And um, you're still assured that someone like you is in charge in some ways. But I could see a case um, for combining this kind of direct assemblies, maybe at the local level, with lotocratic institutions um, elsewhere. Hello, I, oh my gosh, hello. I, um, it seems to me that part of the motivation of this picture is to describe political de deliberation in a way that doesn't reduce to something like interest and power and instead focus on epistemic and emotive elements. I wonder though if there isn't a way for some of that like power and interest narrative to come back in one particular example being um, 
You described there being a different sort of love and interest in truth tracking between the citizens' assemblies and the yellow vest protesters. It seems to me that one like discontinuity between the two um, that may describe this like difference is um, alienation from power versus being in power. Mm -hmm. So if you're elevated to a citizen's assembly, you have a degree of power, and that maybe changes what kind of norms are adaptive in that context. Whereas if you're protesting or rioting, maybe the norms that are very in-group focused are actually adaptive in some sense, because you have to think, how do we coordinate together really effectively in order to wield power that we are you know, disenfranchised or alienated from? And then if something like power can do part of the explanatory work for why there are these different emerging norms, maybe it's that, like, I wonder if there isn't a problem where maybe power is doing a large part of the explanation, and then it's actually like the equality and people's empowerment that is doing anything of epistemic value, and you might like lose a distinction between something like, um, like sortition versus direct democracy, if empowerment is the thing doing the explanation for why there's a difference in norms and outcomes. Yeah, um, except that I feel like neither of these spaces are, uh, unfortunately, totally empowered at the moment. Um, citizens' assemblies right now are still mostly consultative. Um, it's true that, the, the, for, the, to me, the, the, the Convention on Climate, the first one in France, was unique in the, the promise that was made to it. They basic, it basically turned the, the citizens in quasi-legislators. And of course, the promise wasn't kept. Uh, and surprisingly, and then the second convention, the one I was on, the expectations were lowered considerably, right? There was no promise of no filter, n none of that. In the case of the, the yellow vests, um, it's, it's, they're not really empowered either. They, they are empowering themselves um, through, through, these, through sheer numbers and protests. So their goal is different. They're not trying to deliberate to figure out the common good of the country. They're, they're, trying to figure out an entry point to even being heard, and that starts with donning a neon jacket and being really loud, because otherwise they're just not even part of the picture. Um, so it's a different kind of politics, and I, and I think it's very useful and complementary to, to what I'm talking about. I do think that you, I, I tend to think that you would need less of that in a system that was already kind of taking into account those voices. And, the, and you would in a autocratic sort of system because, and I saw it actually, uh, again, in the regional citizens' assemblies that, that were organized during the great national debate, I went to one in Rouen, a smaller scale, you had people with their citizen, uh, you know, the, their, their yellow vest jacket at tables, and they were very loud and angry, and, but they, they were there, they were there, and they are not in parliament right now. So in, in no country uh, do you have these kinds of people. Um, hi, thanks so much. Uh, this is really a, a, a great uh, talk. Um, I, in particular, am interested in one feature of institutional design that you talked about, sort of opinion subgroups. Um, mm -hmm. If I understood, so this question is like half clarificatory and you know mm -hmm. half maybe a little more objectiony or, or like a worry. Um, but I, if I understood it correctly, it seems that there was this like concern that certain opinions weren't being voiced. Um, and so you, we created, these subgroups were created in order to, to facilitate that, and to a large extent, um, they succeeded at the cost of this logic of winning, et cetera. So I'm wondering if that maybe points to a, a, a sort of conflict or a tension between like the truth orientation and love on the one hand and some of the epistemic virtues of deliberation that you're talking about in like some of your previous work. Um, I, I don't want to just reference your previous. Ah, it, it totally does, and so you're basically nailing the question that, for me, this brought up and I haven't solved, which is right. that on the one hand, I think we had to create these opinion groups because yeah. they, we were losing them. They, right. they felt not seen, they felt not heard. They to told us, when we talk about our faith, we, we come across as medieval and alien, and we don't feel like we belong. So we thought, okay, we, we have to do something. They have to find people like them. And, and, and do what's called enclave deliberation to develop a stronger case, which they did. So that was all good. So that was all epistemically beneficial in some ways. It did come at the expense of, and that's something I figured out recently, it did come at the expense of the unity of the group. Mm. And so I don't know what that means, but my sense is that it means that maybe we should have had these groups, uh, two things. Either we should have had these groups only punctually, like just to give them the confidence and the recognition they needed, 
and then broken down everybody again into random groups and not allowing the groups to continue. I don't know if that would have been enough because at that point, they, uh, who knows? I, that's one hypothesis. Hypothesis number two is that you, we, maybe we should not have created these opinion groups and instead, and it's an idea I had early on in the process, but for all kinds of reasons, it was not implemented. And you, you force people to, you force, you, you, you make people adopt uh, a position on the basis of a, of a random assignment. You make them um, defend the position in favor of euthanasia. And then you, you, know, you get people to argue the for and, and the pro and cons, but without, without feeling that they're being identified with the position because no one knows what they truly believe, right? And, and that might have helped um, um, make the supporters of euthanasia and assisted dying understand better the value and, and, and um, you know, worth of, of the religious view without having the, opinion, the minorities do that work, which is you know, emotionally costly, um, perhaps stigmatizing, you know, so that's another option, but I don't have the answer at this point in time. Yeah. Thank you, awesome. Thanks for your time and one more speech. And I'm very curious about why you insist why you insist to emphasize the word love instead of reducing it to some more reachable words like equality and friendship. And my concern is as follows. So as we know, for a politically re proposal to be reachable or ex effective, it has to be epistemologically reachable. And you mentioned that love can be reached Love in politics can be reached through institutional design, which is rather scientific, or the, which is where the scientific parts came in. However, it seems to me that love is such strong feeling that it's hard to reach scientifically. I'm not suspect of your example of city assembly working out well, but however, uh, I mean, if love is scientifically so easily reachable, then why there aren't many well-acknowledged cases of love among organizations? Uh, I mean, perhaps your cases of city assembly um, could be not that statistically significant. I mean, it, it's perhaps because members in city assemblies who work out well share some special characteristics like they share similar ident identity or economic level. So, I mean, I mean, why, do, why don't we reduce the, the strong word of love into some more scientifically reachable ideas like mm -hmm. equality and friendship that which could possibly be more easily to be realized through institutional design. Okay, good, good. I think I got the gist. Um, so why don't we, why do you aim for love, which is such a demanding emotion, and uh, why not go for something else? Friendship maybe, you said also equality, I believe. Um, you could also say respect, right? Well, I wanna say that what surprised me, first of all, so I, I use the vocabulary of love because that's the vocabulary the citizens used. So I'm trying to be truthful to what I saw and the experience they seem to have. And second, I actually now disagree that it's so hard to generate love because apparently you throw a bunch of random people for three weekends together with good food and, uh, and, a, and a common goal and after three, three weekends they love each other. So it's not that hard, it turns out. And maybe it's actually easier to, th than trying to educate people with respect, these abstract notions don't seem to have that much traction, it turns out. I mean, or it's, an hab it's a habituation that takes a whole youth to inculcate, right? Whereas there's something about the viscerality of love that I think um, maybe it turns out that it's a step prior to respect. Like you first need to have that strong emotion and attachment and then it will sort of fade and turn into respect and, and as it expands the circle of, of the people it applies to or something like that. And, and this assumption that we should aim for less, again, if you can get that in three weekends, and 
it's about six million euros a piece to, to, to do an assembly like, uh, like the French Citizens uh, Convention on Climate. Why not? Why not? Um, it's not that much money compared to what, what's the cost of a presidential election these days, a billion dollar, and all you get is hate. No, it sounds like a better deal to do a couple of citizens' assemblies to me. Thanks for our response. Thank you.